Hey, this is Jeff Waters from the Canadian metal band Annihilator, and you're listening to the one and only Target Audience Magazine with Better Be Sharp. A suicide Society, we've all gone bloody mad. Welcome to the dark side of our human race, crumbling before us, ending in disgrace. Politicians... Hey, everybody, thanks for listening. This is Barry Adkins with Target Audience Magazine and Better Be Sharp here today with Canadian metal thrasher band uh, frontman, now singer, and guitarist uh, Jeff Waters. So, Jeff, how's it going? Yeah, good, Barry. How you doing? Oh, well, I'm having a horrendous day, but... It's... <laughs> hey, wait, that's my line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's about to get a lot better. Good. So, Suicide Society, your 15th album with Annihilator, is coming out on September 18th. That is just three days from today. So, I gotta ask, in comparison to Alice in Hell, how does it feel having this album released in comparison to when that album was about to come out? Well, I mean, the feeling of actually having an album done and it's out or coming out, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, kind of the anticipation compared to your first album being released versus this one, and you've done it 15 times. Yeah, I, I guess the thing is for, for I'm assuming, most all musicians, the first one's always incredible because there's been, usually for most, I'll say for most musicians, there's been years and years and years and even a decade of extremely hard work and practicing, hopefully, to get to the point where you're lucky enough and and talent a bit there and you know you know many different reasons um right place right time sometimes and and whatever and keeping things together and having a vision and drive and all that you know, you know you've had time to to build and focus on things and then when you finally get to that goal of gee i want to be in a band and i i know i'll never be as good as you know, Slayer or Metallica or Megadeth or Exodus or all that, you know, when you're a teenager and you're trying to be honest or you're being honest, you, you want to be like those guys and, and hopefully you're not thinking you're going to be better, but if that's your goal and you, you know, you, you, you just try to, to see what they're doing and how they're doing, why you like it and see if you can get something almost as good as that, when you actually get to that first record and, and it happens, it's uh, sometimes it's a real shock because some people... You know, you, you sort of feel the confidence of, yeah, I want to do that, and that's my goal. But when you get there, you're like, wow, it actually happened. <laughs> you know, so that was, that was it's a different feeling than when you do maybe the fifth or the tenth or the fifteenth. And I guess that actually saying that it sounds kind of funny because I don't know how many bands in metal music have put fifteen records out, <laughs> but other than the, you know, our, our maidens and priests and, and, and these kinds of bands, but. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's an amazing thing for a different way. It's amazing for me because um, just it's it's been I has been a, a completely different way of doing things about presenting ourselves. Uh, most of the time, the presenting ourselves part with the musicians and the style of music we do is just it just happens. It's not a planned thing. It just comes out, and you know, uh, I hire a different drummer or a different singer, or somebody leaves, I replace them. And it's kind of, kind of like a bit of a solo kind of project. We've had our example, our first four records we did from 89 to 95 were very successful records, and they had four different singers on the first four records. And that was kind of like, I mean, that's a completely weird way of doing it, and very uh, few few bands, I think, ever have done that. And it's just a, it's just a strange way of doing it, and it's just worked. And it hasn't worked in all countries or territories in, in the world, but it's worked in Europe and South America and Japan. And um, we sort of had Canada and the States following us for the first uh, three records we did, and we uh, partially for what we were doing, I guess, at the time, and also the the metal scene kind of most of it ran away back in '93 in North right. America. Um, Anyway, I could babble forever. You got to interrupt me and, and put me on track here, will you? Oh, yeah, the feeling is great. It's a great feeling. It's more of a feeling now of every time you do it, you sit back and you go, "Wow, this is amazing." That you know, another one. Holy crap! You know, you're just like grateful. You get more and more grateful. A lot of people get more and more bitter, um, or more and more this or that, or wanting more of this. Or I'm more like. Uh, just sort of shaking my head and looking in the mirror and laughing and going, holy crap, did you ever imagine that when you were a teenager, you know? It's right. It, yeah, you can, now you, I kind of look at it like I'm turning 50 pretty soon and uh, 15 records and, and, you know, a thousand shows or whatever it is and all the things we've done overseas for, for so long, it's, um, 
it's an honor to play with all these bands that I idolized in my youth and now and, and uh, play with good musicians, great musicians in the band I'm in. And so it's a blast. It's just amazing every year you go through it and you just sort of laugh and uh, just try your best and have a hell of a lot of fun when you can. That's all we can ask for. And um, you mentioned the first four records had four different singers. And just recently, of course, uh, your longtime singer and guitarist, Dave Padden, dropped out. I know you've talked a lot about this um, as you were beginning to make Suicide Society. And so you've had to step up yourself as a singer once again because you did three records, I believe it was, back in the 90s where you were the uh, the front man um, for the band. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think with, with Dave, uh, he was the first musician. Dave Padden was the first musician that I... I kind of actually wanted to stick with, and without thinking about it, it was just natural that you'd sort of wake up and work on music, and you'd have Dave's voice in mind or Dave's guitar playing for the live stuff that he was doing. He's people play guitar live and sing live and sing in the studio, of course. And it was just year after year. It was it was not even a question of uh, hey, I'd like to change the singer or maybe just change things up a bit in, in that area. It was just like well, and then after a decade with him many records you start going oh okay i guess this is my guy for the rest of the career <laughs> so uh, i w literally woke up just i think it was december 3rd or 4th and was kind of excited because i uh, you know i'd finished this uh, suicide society record already all the music was recorded i just finished it i'd written all the lyrics and the melody lines and i was doing my usual karaoke singing along to the the song uh, to make a sort of like a demo tape for dave to listen to and, and know what i wanted on the songs when he flew into to my studio um, so everything was normal and I got an email from him the next day when I was about to book his flight and he just literally said, listen, I know I left this to the last minute, but, uh, I have to leave the band. And I said, uh Oh, what's wrong? Uh, is it me? Is it the music? Is it, do you need more money? Uh, no problem. Let me know what you need and, you know, we'll work it out. And, uh, turned out it wasn't anything. He said it wasn't anything to do with, uh, any of that. It was something about essentially not wanting to go away from home or, and just being sick of the traveling. And, you know, part of me thinks there's something else going on, maybe a medical thing or a family thing or something. But the other part is um, you slowly start, start to realize that some people can't stand the travel and the life. It's, I mean, for me, it's great. It's like traveling and flying and eating really cool different foods, seeing old friends from you know, decades ago and, you know, meeting new people and the fans and there's so many cultures to see and so many different things out there, and I love every aspect of it. Um, and some guys probably love it at the beginning and then finally just say, listen, I don't want to do this anymore. And um, so I, I've sort of chalked it up to that was the reason, I think. Um, and then I just looked around for another singer and thought, you know what? It's been a hell of a long time with Dave, and I think I already sang on this record. <laughs> I kind of sang the whole thing already, and... I'm going to do this. It's a challenge. I've been playing guitar with Annihilator for so long, and, and literally, as much fun as it is touring and playing on stage, because it's a blast. I love it. You can't wait. It's not much of a challenge. You know, the, cha the only real challenge is that you, you try to get in a little bit better shape than you are when you're at home, sitting on your butt in the studio eating pizza. You try to get in better shape, uh, because, you know, a bit better shape, you're going to put on a bit better show. Um, it, but it's technically, it's not a hell of a challenge to play songs that I've been playing for 25 years. In fact, they make a lot of mistakes simply because I'm so used to playing the bloody things. You start thinking of things that have nothing to do with the song and you goof the parts up. So the idea of singing was kind of cool because, again, was kind of cool because it's a hell of a challenge and it's not something I'm going to be able to do easily and I'm not going to be very good at it for a while, but I want to be good at it and I'm... Uh, rehearsing a lot and working on it and I took lessons and that's what I did on the record. I essentially said I could go in the studio, in my studio and sing this album and do it in a week. I already know the stuff. I already sang on it. But I took two months off and I took vocal lessons and I really worked on my voice to, to really, um, you know, just get better. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not easy for a 49 year old guitar player to turn into a singer again after, and I was never really a singer. I was kind of pushed into singing years ago too. And, um, this time I said, I'm not pushing myself in. I want to do it as a challenge. So it's fun. I can't wait to do this and uh, get better and better at it, hopefully. Well, I'm sure it'll, it'll ease up over time. But um, Yeah, the cool, cool thing, too, is I didn't really, like, I get a lot of questions, too, sometimes from uh, 
you know, not really from journalists or anything, but more like just people that musician friends or whatever, and uh, and old friends or somebody on the internet will ask me a question like, hey, what, what does it feel to actually kind of start singing again? Doesn't your voice get worse with age? Of course, and like hearing, hearing does not get better with age. You know, your ears, it's the same thing with your voice. Technically, you know, it should get better. You should get more knowledgeable and know what you can do with your voice better. But in my case, it was pretty cool because I never sang for. Uh, on tour and since 1997, so I literally had, what, 17 years or 18 years where I didn't use my voice. So that was kind of like, uh, I didn't wear it out for 18 years like a lot of singers would do, right? Um, plus, when I sang before, I never I never knew how to warm them up, up properly or preserve my voice. I, I just yelled, and therefore you're way out of the key, and you just your voice died quick. And now with a bit of knowledge and, and training, you can sort of uh, probably avoid that, Um you know, lots of different uh, cool things about it. Anyway, I'm totally psyched about doing this. It's a challenge. It's a lot of fun. Well, I'm sure that everyone is really psyched to see you guys play. Now, as for the album itself, was there any difference after uh, Dave left as far as, of course, you had to sing, but in, in the making of the album compared to past releases that you've done, was there any difference? No, no, no. No, that was an interesting part because, like I said, everything was written before he'd even heard the records, and it was demoed before he even heard it, Like, which he... He didn't really hear it because I never got to send it to him, but um, it was pretty much finished. Uh, everything was there. Just had to re-sing it and do a better job. And um, so it didn't really. Nah. And a lot of times, Dave over the years would uh, would give me a sort of semi or half pissed off uh, look every time he came into Ottawa to sing because. Every album, he said, Waters, you got to start writing songs where the guitar riffs are simple when the guys, when I'm singing. And when I stop singing, then you can do some technical stuff on the rhythm guitar stuff. But you got to give me a little bit of uh, room to be able to play and sing this stuff. And I'd be, okay, okay, okay. And then that's what I would do the opposite. I would just not even think of the vocals. I'd just write the riffs and say, here you go, sing over that. So it was tough for him to do that. Um, and for me, I, it was the same thing. I didn't get it. I didn't go back and change things up because now I was singing. It was just the same thing, right? And a lot of stuff too. If you hear some similarities about what I'm doing uh, compared with Dave, that's kind of normal because if you consider I wrote the songs and the notes and the melody lines and where the words go, we call it phrasing, I guess. Um, that's. I mean, that is me. That's why a lot of annihilator singers have different sort of um, definitely different voices. But you can always see the common thread in there, and those are like the little Jeffisms we they used to call it in the studio, and and the Jeffisms really are combination of Lane Staley, that kind of vibe, you know. Right. Uh, those those are my favorite kind of singers to sing along to. So that's what comes into the vocal stuff, you know. Absolutely. So I, I guess this uh, this spawns another question: is the, the the writing for Annihilator, it's it's a one-man show, right? Yeah, I guess it's probably been about, I guess, what, 15 records? That's like a, a little over 160 songs. That probably, I don't know, I guess about 95%, 98% of it, somewhere in there, yeah, for sure. It's just my baby. It's like, you got to figure it's mostly a solo project, except when we go on tour, it's a band. That's basically what it is. Gotcha. And... Uh... So as far as the uh, the actual album goes, I, I've listened to it. It sounds awesome. I really like it. I, I loved Feast as well. Um, I like the diversity of the music, and it doesn't just it doesn't just try to pummel you. It it it's not afraid to bring out some softer songs, which some hardcore metal listeners might go, "What is this?" But uh, for me personally, coming from like a classic rock background and uh, then getting into metal later, I, I love having like vocal harmonies and, and softer sides to, uh, to add dynamics. Yeah, that, that's kind of, I guess for 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 the people for people that don't know about Annihilator or they just sort of get glimpses of us or uh, it's kind of like um, essentially Annihilator put three records out and had some success in Canada and the States, but it was very big o o overseas, especially in Europe. In Japan, and uh, in '93, when the you know the Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Smashing Pumpkins, Alanis Morissette, all that stuff came out, and then you know record companies were literally sending out uh, memos saying drop any band that has the word metal in their biography, and um, we were told either change the name and change your uh, music to either a, a Biohazard Sepulture or Pantera style, or we're going to drop you. And, and I said poof, see ya. Um, 
I figured I'd get a new, I get a job, <laughs> cut my hair and get a real job, I guess. But lucky for us, we did, we still had um, we had another record called King of the Kill. And people were really interested in that in Europe when it got signed there in Japan. That was a huge record in Japan and and uh, one of our biggest records in in Europe. So it was kind of like, well, most bands sort of faded away or had to change their style or broke up for 15 years until the reunion. Uh, we just kept going overseas, and it was. Um, you know, and changing members and that and that. So, you know, even our home country, Canada and the United States, I mean, the metal scene lost track of us and lost, lost track mostly of this kind of music, the 80s traditional heavy and thrash metal. Bands like Pantera kept it going and Slayer kept slugging away at it and keeping the, waving the flag for, for the heavier bands during the, the terrible 90s, you know what I mean? It was the Panteras and the Slayers that kept it going. As well as, of course, you know, Motorhead and Priest Maiden, but you remember those times priests were playing stadium or big arenas, and then all of a sudden they're playing clubs, right? Big th- theaters with Ripper Owens, and then you've got Blaze Bailey stepping in, and then everything went to a much smaller scale. And Maiden and bands stopped coming to the states, and they just kept going to South America and other places where they were really still really appreciated. And now, of course, there's been a slow revival of metal in general and old school metal for for quite some years now, but. With Annihilator, essentially, um, Europeans, for example, have always known that Annihilator is either going to put out a love song, a hate song, a punkish, goofy, immature song about craft dinner or food, or a, a true story or a ballad or, a, you know, just a mixture of different stuff. If you go back in the albums and actually someone took the time to go through all the records that they, they never heard of before, you know, you're going to go, wait a sec, a band called Annihilator should sound like Lamb of God or real aggressive and in your face, and, and they, they'd be quite surprised, and, and many are in, in North America for the first time to find a band like Annihilator, and they're supposed to be doing very well in different parts of the world, and then they hear a song and they go, what the hell is that? You know, um, that's more for the heavier fans. And then you've got fans that like a lot of our melodic stuff that we did uh, quite a few years ago, very melodic stuff, and they don't really like the heavier stuff. So Europe already knows that uh, North America are hearing us almost for the first time because the Internet here is really sort of, I guess, really pushing us up in the last couple of records, slowly but surely, and you get the mixture. You get the, who the hell is this? Uh, what kind of song or metal is that? And, and then they hear another song, and then they go, oh, uh, that's not too bad. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Would you ever think about doing something like Opeth did with Deliverance and Damnation and have just albums that are polar opposites of each other? Yeah, the, actually, the only the only thing i done like that was recently, I thought... Uh, it would be, and I've done this before, or thought about this before at least. It would be kind of funny, just because it's almost like I can put a record out in Europe, and as long as it's honest and I love it, I work hard on it. Um, you know, you're never gonna always have ten out of tens or or zero out of tens. I mean, you're gonna try for ten out of ten, but no band does that over and over. No band, ACDC never continued making Back in Black or Highway to Hell, and Maiden never, Power Slave and Number the Beast did not keep repeating and and having that kind of record, Slayer's Reign of Blood, and Sup Heaven, and Annihilator, Never Never Land, we've never made a record that, quote, good again, and we never will. Um, but as long as you're honest and you try hard, and you, you really really do this um, as good as you can. You know what, I forgot the question, because I'm, I'm babbling so much. Give me the question real quick. Oh, I was just uh, going off. Or I made you forget. About going from... Um, heavy songs. Oh yeah, the polar opposites, right? Yeah, yeah. polar opposite albums. I did think, anyway, what I sh- should have said before I got sidetracked myself was that uh, I kind of thought it would be kind of funny because Europe would would love this is to do, you know, you know, eighteen or twenty songs. So basically, a CD one would be all melodic, and I don't mean sucky pop songs. I mean everything from ballads to pop to hot, hard rock to to this sort of, you know, just the real, the stuff that I also like to write, and then do a second CD on, you know, in the package of just the heavier version. So literally, you could get two for the price of one, and you could throw the other one in the garbage if you really didn't like it, and <laughs> listen to the other one, just kind of as a, just a fun thing, not to prove anything, but just, Europe would love it, because then it, they they would love that, because that's kind of what Europe is for us, they it's not just for us. For for they're a different culture of metal. That you can have one festival where you'd have Marilyn Manson, a 
a complete radio pop pan- band, uh, even a, a pop dance soul hip hop artist, and then you get Slayer on the same bill. You know, it's it's a lot more um, open minded, and I don't mean that in a negative way because in Canada and the United States, it's it's also really cool because. When you get a Lamb of God fan or you get a fan that's into the uh, heavier type of music, man, they are into it, you know, and they will, they'll, they'll rip your head off if you're not fitting into what they, they like or, or, you know. So bands over here have to be a little more careful than we do. We just don't care. We do what we want. And we, uh, I just take the flack as pe- more and more people here in North America are discovering us. But I also take the, uh, the good side of that, which is people are starting to go, hey, this this kind of stuff's kind of neat. It's not all super brutal screaming and aggression, but there is some aggression in some of what's going on here, but just in a different way. Right, and speaking of aggression and uh, getting things out, of course, uh, the title track off Suicide Society is called Suicide Society. And uh, from what I've heard, you ended up writing about three pages about human failures, um, destroying the environment, uh, people being bribed in, in politics and so yep. forth, um, and, and just kind of wrote it down and then formed a song. Now, I, I want to go back on your album, Refresh the Demon. Yep. There's a song called Innocent Eyes. Yeah. And uh, there, there's a line in there that I was listening to, and it says, I worry for you as I look to the future, and, and you're singing to, uh, to your, uh, your child. Kid. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was just wondering, is, is that kind of a good lead-in? For, uh, for where Suicide Society picks up? Not really, but yes, you picked up on something there, but that was more on a difficult time I was going through as a parent. And uh, my son lost his mother to cancer. So that was, that was more a personal thing for me about worrying about what was going to happen in the future. That was more how his father, me, was going to survive all the shit I was going through, basically. Um, the suicide society, yeah, in other words, society wasn't really what I was worried for him. You know, it was really was Waters, his dad, going to get through what he was getting through to be a good father, or at least as good as I could be, right? So that was kind of a real personal um, father, son, hope I can do the best job I can do under the circumstances that I've been put through here. Um, and um, basically crappy, bad luck of the draw and sad circumstances. So I was a single dad for, I've been a single dad since he was a baby. Um, so anyway, yeah, literally a couple of years old. But um, Suicide Society turned that was a completely sort of different way. And that could have been, yeah, it could have been for a kid or a child or something. But that, that was written more along the lines. It started off being just another subject to write about. I'd write down subjects over the years that might work. And, you know, some of our lyrics are very direct some of them are a little cheesy some of them are funny some of them are not extremely talented uh, to to come up with not very poetic uh but some of them actually mean something some of them are true stories and and, and, and that kind of stuff they, they really vary and you can i mean people could take that like i guess another reason why europeans are a little more open-minded to annihilator would be because maybe they're they need the more basic or the more the more simpler kind of vibe or direct vibe to the lyrics to really relate to it if English is not their first language. And even if somebody goes to school for years in, in Germany or somewhere else, not everyone really gets a lot of the stuff that's going on. You know, it's like in, in every language you you can learn it in school, but there's unless you're really taking years or decades to learn it and live that in that country, you're going to miss things. Anyway, so with our stuff, Suicide Society basically was different that was more um what in the hell are we doing and and it was not really meant to be one of these songs that meant that much to me when i was writing it because it was another subject and i knew it was kind of a cliche subject to write about every punk band in the 70s was writing about that kind of thing right um the environment and, and what we're doing but i did write it down and became kind of disgusted and it was kind of a, a a life uh, lightning bolt kind of reality check about life to me, which was, you know, you can say all you want about how many good people and are doing so, in, doing so many good things in the world, which is completely true. But the reality is if you take the top five, ten, or five or ten most important things that we need in life as humans, the air, the, you know, the, the water, the, you know, getting along or not being, crime, you know, just food, everything. 
everything is getting worse. All the main things are getting worse, um, not getting better. And it's more, it's not really necessarily a pessimistic song. It's more a reality check. And it's a really disgusting, sad reality check. Um, unfortunately, I did have more to say and I did, I did, I wish I could have written, you know, 20 or 10 pages on this. Um, but you have to condense it into three short verses and a chorus. And, uh, the only way I could do that was just quickly fire off a bunch of lines about what a disgrace we've been to each other and to Mother Earth and animals and the environment. Um, and until the very end of the song, there's really not a glimpse of hope because most of the things that I'm talking about are not getting better. They're getting worse, and some of these things are going to be impossible to fix. Um, and in the very end, there's a little hope of, but if we all come together in the end and do something about this mess we made, maybe we can fix some of the shit. So anyway, that that... That was just another subject to write about, and by the end of writing that song, I was completely uh, had a little, we say, come to Jesus moment, you know, where you're like, holy crap, what are we doing, you know?